You know, the experience of walking through the scriptures book by book is an interesting one. And it's just blessing after blessing. And I don't know how you have been experiencing the Psalms or how you felt when we first got to them. 150 chapters of this book. And just on the other side of them, we get into the prophets. You know, and and you, you just find yourself, if you're anything like me, just raring for the prophets. I want to get there. But it's interesting how the Psalms impact us and and how unique each book is and how well-placed each book is in this journey through the Scriptures. I want to just share with you a brief excerpt from an email I got last week. I won't say from who because I don't want to embarrass Mary, but as I read the Psalms, she wrote, I notice it's a book so different than any of the others in that so many of the others include such detail that sometimes it seems my head is going to explode with keeping it all straight. But the Psalms are beautiful and almost poetic in nature. And the common themes of praise and trust and confidence in the Lord truly touches my heart. The Psalms I have read thus far have reinforced my commitment to come to the Lord with those same feelings. Listen to this. So often I have a mental list of folks for which I need to pray, and that's my first priority. Anyone else like that? But now I think... First and foremost, I need to come to the Lord recognizing Him as my only God, my Lord of Lords, my King of Kings, my Alpha and Omega, my One and Only, to show the same level of praise, trust, and confidence in my Lord that David did over and over again. And I couldn't have said it any better. This is something that the Psalms teach us, how to come to the Lord in confidence, not how to come to the Lord with lists, The lists we'll always be able to get to. The lists are always there. But to simply come to the Lord, prayer is not just about laundry lists. It's about expressing and and rediscovering sometimes even confidence and trust in the Lord. And as Mary noted, you will find again and again in the Psalms, David comes back to that same place of trust, that expression of confidence, that belief, that praise, that worship that truly sets our focus on Jesus as Lord. Now that being said, today's psalm is slightly different in that rather than being a personal psalm or prayer, it's a corporate prayer by the people for their king that he might have confidence in the Lord. Follow this through. Psalm 20, verse 1. May the Lord answer you in the day of trouble. May the name of the God of Jacob set you securely on high. May he send you help from the sanctuary and support you from Zion. May he remember all your meal offerings and find all your burnt offering acceptable. May he grant you your heart's desire and fulfill all your counsel. We will sing for joy over your victory and in the name of our God we will set up our banners. May the Lord fulfill all your petitions. Now I know that the Lord saves his anointed. He will answer him from his holy heaven with the saving strength of his right hand. Some boast in chariots and some in horses, but we will boast in the name of the Lord our God. They have bowed down and fallen, but we have risen and stood upright. Save, O Lord. May the King answer us in the day we call. This study is well-timed for Memorial Day weekend. Because not only is it a people's prayer for their King's faith. But it's a prayer to be sung, to be prayed, to be offered on the eve of battle. It was just nine short years ago when worldviews collided on September 11th, 2001. I don't know if you've heard about this, perhaps some of you have. But you recall, I know, United Flight 93. They crashed in Somerset County, Pennsylvania, that flight that never made it to its destination that the terrorists intended it for to get back into Washington and either take out the Capitol or the White House. And the passengers on board there got word as they're calling in their cell phones secretly. The terrorists had control of the plane and they're calling to try and find out what's going on and they realize this is one of several planes that two planes had already hit in New York. And so they knew what was at stake. You recall the famous words of Todd Beamer saying, let's roll. And that small cadre of passengers who stormed the cockpit and took the plane down rather than have it take out our Capitol or the White House. An amazing story. 
What you may or may not be aware of, however, is the design of the memorial to remember what happened. Let me tell you about it. In 2004, the design for a monument there in Somerset County was unveiled. It was unveiled to immediate objection. It was called the Crescent of Embrace. The Crescent of Embrace, featuring a half moon of red and sugar maple trees that were chosen because they would turn bright uh, every fall in in remembrance of what happened. Every September, you'd have this bright red crescent moon of trees. And it opened out that crescent moon, which coincidentally is the symbol for Islam, opened out in a direct line facing to Mecca. Now where the star is, on the crescent moon and star of the symbol of Islam, where the star is, there was a a wall, a small wall of memorial that's erected there. Now again, there was a, a big furor over this, over the fact that it looks so much like the crescent moon of Islam, and it was Islamic terrorists that that were the cause of that tragedy. So they redesigned it in 2005. The redesign was little more than a name change. It then was called the Bowl of Embrace, rather than Crescent, or simply the Flight 93 Memorial. But not much has changed. The half moon shape still remains. They added a few trees a little bit on either side, ostensibly to make it a little less Crescent-shaped. But the opening of the circle still remains in a direct line to Mecca, which is, by the way, a requirement of every Muslim mosque. And by the way, in closing that circle, it reminds me, and I may have told you this recently, in fact, I'm pretty sure I did, that you need to pay attention to the Muslim symbol of that half moon, that crescent shape, because it's no longer a half moon. It is now a half moon with the closed circle all the way around it, which is an indication of world conquest, world domination. Now, at the entrance of that place where the star appears, as I told you before, that memorial half wall was erected. It contains 40 blocks of glass to honor the fallen heroes of Flight 93, including passengers, pilots, and flight attendants. Originally, there were 44 blocks of glass to include the terrorists. At the entrance to the monument, there stands what is called the Tower of Voices, containing 40 wind chimes that would blow in the breeze. This tower, this spire running straight up, coincidentally is in the shape of a minaret, which is standard fare for a Muslim mosque. And I read about this, and I just thought, why is it that in the face of all that's happened, we continue to trend toward the enemies of freedom rather than to embrace freedom. Is it appeasement? I'm assuming that's the heart behind it. If we can just appease the bully, perhaps he'll stop picking on the kindergartner. You know, if we can just all give him our sack lunch, then perhaps all the bullying on the playground will go away. I don't get that mentality. Now, I realize that there are those who will say, Rick, not all Muslims are radical. You're painting an unfair picture if you, if you point that direction. Many people say it's only 10% of all Islam that's truly radical. First of all, that number is absolutely not true. That's the number that's touted, that's thrown out there. It's not true. But, but, okay, we'll give you that number, and we'll assume for a moment that 10%, only 10% of Islam in the world today is radical. There's 1.3 billion Muslims in the world. That means 130 million are radical which is one-third the population of the United States of America. (laughs) And even mainstream Islam divides the world into two houses, two distinct spheres. Dar al-Islam, which means the house of Islam, and Dar al-Jihad, the house of war. You're in one of the two. You either accept Allah as your God and accept Islam and therefore join Dar al-Islam, or you don't and you're in the house of war. And those are the two options laid out for the world, while we build monuments to appease the mindset. Why do we keep trending toward the enemies of freedom? It's because the enemy of freedom is good at what he does. Ultimately, this is a spiritual issue, gang. The Muslims have it right. It is a holy war. It is a spiritual war. 
And our eyes as believers need to be wide open to what is going on. That 2 Corinthians 4, 2 tells us the God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelieving so they might not see the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ. What is the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ? It is freedom. Freedom in Christ Jesus. Freedom from law. Freedom from sin. Freedom by grace. That is the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ. That's what Jesus wants for the world. That's why God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. That's the issue. And so you better believe the enemy of freedom, the enemy of Christ, Satan himself, wants nothing more than to undermine and take away and destroy any cause of freedom in the world. What does this all have to do with Psalm 20? Well, as I said already, it's a prayer for Israel's king. It's a people's cry for victory against the enemies of the God of Jacob on the eve of battle. Let's look at this. We, we have a, an idea, by the way, of what it is that inspired this Psalm of David. Of, of what event was happening, what was going on. The story is told in 2 Samuel in chapter 10. You can turn there if you'd like to. I'm just going to read a couple of... Excerpts from it. Second Samuel chapter ten. Story is also told in First Chronicles nineteen, a parallel story to it. We'll just go to Second Samuel ten. And verse three. It's background for Psalm twenty. Let me go back to verse one just to get the context here. It happened afterwards that the king of the Ammonites died. It's a king named Nahash, who had been kind to David. Not so kind to Saul, but kind to David. And Hanun, his son, became king in his place. And David said, I'll show kindness to Hanun, the son of Nahash, just as his father showed kindness to me. So David sent some of his servants to console him concerning his father, his father's death. But when David's servants came to the land of the Ammonites, the princes of the Ammonites said to Hanun, their lord, Do you think that David's honoring your father because he has sent consolers to you? (laughs) <laughs> Has not David sent his servants to you in order to search the city, to spy it out and overthrow it? So Hanun took David's servants and shaved off half of their beards and cut off their garments in the middle as far as the hips and sent them away. And I told you before when we studied this, we're talking half beards and the full monty. Verse 5. When they told it to David, he sent to meet them for the king For the men were greatly humiliated, and the king said, Stay at Jericho until your beards grow, and then return. You see, you can provide clothes immediately, but as far as the beards go, that's an absolute insult. In fact, to uh, Orthodox Jews today, and to Jews back in that time, to shave off the beard was an absolute shame. To have half a beard was a shameful thing. So David sensitively said, Guys, I want you to stay in Jericho. Let your beards grow back, and then when you come back home, everything will be all right. It's an incredible story. But verse 6 goes on and says, When the sons of Ammon saw that they had become odious, that is, stinkers, to David, the sons of Ammon sent and hired the Aramaeans of Beth Rehob and the Aramaeans of Zobah, 20,000 foot soldiers, and the king of Maacah with 1,000 men, and the men of Tob with 12,000 men. And when David heard of it, he sent Joab and all the army, the mighty men. The sons of Ammon came out and drew up in battle array at the entrance of the city, while the Aramaeans of Zobah and of Rehob and the men of Tob and Maaka were by themselves in the field. Ammon and Aram, or the Aramaeans. Ammon is Jordan today. Ammon, Jordan. Aram, or the Aramaeans, are the Syrians. The same history, same location. These are the people groups, and it's interesting to me that history changes little. As the Syrians are still technically at war with Israel. That's never changed. They've never had a peace treaty. They are technically still at war with Israel. As far as the Jordanians, you think, oh, well, they're, they're cool. Everything's good there. Not lately. Not lately. Anti-Israel sentiment has been growing dramatically even within what we would consider moderate Jordan. Now, I want you to see something and understand a picture that you might miss unless it's a big picture. Even as we studied through all the wars of David, as we went through First and Second Samuel, as we studied the Chronicles and looked at these things, there's something you might not see if it wasn't pointed out. Many look at King David and the history of Israel and they regard King David's wars as conquests. That is that David was out there increasing the boundaries of Israel. 
And there are some who reach as far back as David and say, see, that's always been the attitude of the Jews, was conquest. It's always been their attitude to expand, to take territory. And to this day, some call the Israelis Zionist land grabbers, demanding that Israel return to its pre-1967 borders. You've taken our land, and it's not right, and it's not fair. Note this, even though we recognize that the Lord gave Abraham and his offspring, through the line of Jacob, 300,000 square miles, a title deed to all that land, even though we recognize that, listen, every single war of David, and you can go through it and study it out yourself, every war of David was in response to enemy attack. Every one. David was not a mighty king of conquest. He was not a warrior of conquest. It was always defense. Did the territory of Israel expand? You bet it did. But it always came after attack. Study your Bibles. David did not initiate battle offensively to take land. He initiated battle defensively to save Israel. Sound familiar? It should, if you read the history accounts, the factual accounts of modern Israel, you'll find the same thing to be true, my friends. 1948, 1956, 1967, 1973, 1982, 2006. Always in response. Well, in 2006, Israel invaded Lebanon. Yeah, how many missiles were fired into Israel before they did? Thank you. It's always in defensive response. When Israel's boundaries increase, it's been defensive against acts of aggression, against provocation by the surrounding Arab nations. And land that's been held has been in defense to protect their right to exist in the land. And listen, no nation in world history has ever been expected or asked to return land won in a war when they were attacked in the first place. Only Israel. It's wrong, it's wicked, it's diabolical. In other words, it's satanic. That's why it's only Israel that's been attacked. Now, regardless of modern thinking, I will continue to believe as grafted in children of the God of Jacob, we need to stand with Israel. Now, Psalm 20 is a prayer of Israel, the people of Israel, praying for their king, praying for David. A prayer for victory in the face of war. By the way, Psalm 21, which we'll get to Wednesday night, is a praise for that victory after the battle is won. So you have the psalm of praise before the battle, and you have the psalm of praise after the battle, Psalm 20 and 21. Now, Psalm 20, you can divide it into two parts. The first half, verses 1 through 5, is the people's appeal to the Lord for the king. The people's appeal to the Lord for the king. They're praying for David or for the king at that time. The second half, verses 6 through 9, is the king's assurance in the Lord for the people. People pray, appeal to the Lord for the king, and the king is assured in the Lord for the people. Let's look at this. Verse 1. May the Lord answer you in the day of trouble. May the name of the God of Jacob set you securely on high. Some things to jot down if you like to take notes. First of all, recognition of identification. Recognition of identification. The people direct the king's attention to security in the God of Jacob. May the name of the God of Jacob set you securely on high. I like that. God of Jacob. It's not God of Israel. It's God of Jacob. Heel catcher. That's what Jacob means. That liar, that schemer, that conniver, that trickster. And yet, God has never been ashamed to be called the God of Jacob. How interesting. And why not the God of Israel? God changed his name to Israel. Some might think because I don't want to be associated with the way you were. <laughs> The way you were, Jacob, I'd rather be associated with Israel. But he's not. He's called God of Jacob again and again. Listen, he associates himself with Jacob, not because of what Jacob did for God, but because of what God did for and through Jacob. Because Jacob, like all of us, was a used-to-be. Used to be a conniver. Used to be a liar. Used to be a schemer until God got a hold of him. And God made the difference. And Jacob's very name change to Israel reveals this to us. The name Israel means God prevails. God prevails. 
There's great grace here. And with grace comes a reminder that victory is only by His hands. It's a perfect name to cry out to. May the name of the God of Jacob set you securely on high. The God by whose power Jacob would ultimately become Israel. And what's great is that as God the Father associates His name with Jacob, so God the Son associates His name with you and with me. He's the God of Rick. And he is not ashamed to be called such. Paul wrote in 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 11, To this end we pray for you always, that our God will count you worthy of your calling and fulfill every desire for goodness and the work of faith with power so that the name of our Lord Jesus will be glorified in you and you in Him according to the grace of our God and the Lord Jesus Christ. The very fact that we're called Christians associated, identified with Christ is amazing to me and wonderful and blessed and is a great grace. We're tied to the name. Verse 2. May He send you help from the sanctuary and support you from Zion. So recognition of identification is number two. Realization of foundation. And this is all by way of encouragement for the king. A realization of his foundation that the king's help, that the king's support, comes from the sanctuary in Zion. What does that mean? It's a direct focus on the tabernacle there in Jerusalem. People are praying. They're crying out, Realize, O king, our victory does not and will not and cannot come from the high places of pagan worship. Our victory cannot and will not and does not come from the military might of horses and chariots or the strength of the IDF. That is not where our victory comes from. Our victory comes out of Zion. Our victory is connected to the temple. Zion. And we're not talking about Zion, Utah. Or Zion, Illinois, or Washington, D.C. Our victory does not come out of those places. No, our foundation, like Israel's, our victory comes out of Mount Zion, God's capital, Jerusalem, there in Israel. But please understand, I've talked a lot about Jerusalem and its importance. I've talked about the fact that it is called the apple of God's eye, that it is the one location on all of planet Earth that God chose to set His name. The one city God said, this is mine. Forever. However, please understand that your foundation, Israel's foundation, is far greater than location. Zion is not great because it's Zion. It's great because of its founding. Because of its founding. What is it that makes America a great nation? What is it that makes the American people unique? Is it somehow that you and I have greater skills? Because we're Americans, we're more ingenious, we have more innovation than other peoples around the globe. That's not what made America unique in the first place. Its founding is what made it unique. The founding of this country is what set it apart. Those godly principles, that with the exception of Israel, America is the only nation on earth, at least that I'm aware of, that drew back to the Ten Commandments and said, let's, let's base ourselves off of this. This is a solid foundation. Let's be founded under the Judeo-Christian God. That's our foundation. And the uniqueness and the success of America for 200 plus years has been in that founding. Though we have waffled and wandered at times, it is our founding that, that makes this a great nation. Isaiah 28.16 tells us, Thus says the Lord God, Behold, I am laying in Zion a stone, a tested stone, a costly cornerstone for the foundation firmly placed. He who believes in it will not be disturbed. The founding of Zion, the foundation stone of Zion, is Mashiach, Jesus Christ. That's why, why Zion is great. That's what's blessed about Zion. Jesus is the costly cornerstone. Jesus is the foundation stone. So the prophets, Joel, Isaiah, Zechariah, they declare, out of Zion He will come. And even as this is prayed, may He send you help from the sanctuary. That sanctuary could just as well be the sanctuary in heaven. And may He support you from Zion. As we know, prophetically, Jesus will come out of Zion, the deliverer, 
Well, Paul said it, Romans 11.26. All Israel will be saved just as it, as it is written. The deliverer will come from Zion and will remove ungodliness from Jacob. That's the foundation. Now, whether the Jewish people recognize it at this point in history or not, their foundation is their Mashiach, their Messiah, the anointed king who is coming. He is the foundation stone of Zion. Verse 3, they continue to pray for the king. May he remember all your meal offerings and find your burnt offering acceptable. What's the deal here? Number three is remembrance of acceptance. Remembrance of acceptance. I find this curious. Verse 3 only mentions two offerings here. If you go back to Leviticus chapters 1 through 5, five specific offerings are given given to Israel. And by the way, each one of those five cameos of Jesus Christ, each one of them points in explicit and interesting ways, graphic detail, they point to Jesus as Messiah. And if you haven't heard that, go back and listen to it. Those first five chapters in the study of Leviticus, it's amazing. But only two offerings are listed here, the meal offering and the burnt offering. Why is that? Well, a couple of things. One, history tells us that before the kings went to battle, these were the two offerings that they offered. That they would come to the temple, or in David's case, the tabernacle, and there they would offer up the meal offering and the burnt offering. Saul does it in 1 Samuel 13, 9. So we know there's a connection there just historically. And these voluntary offerings were understood to bring the people to God's remembrance. We're going to offer this up, remind the Lord, we're here, and we're in dire straits, and we're on the edge of battle here, so just remember us, Lord. And that was the idea behind them. But if you look more closely at the two offerings, the meal offering was a cake of unleavened bread. And that unleavened bread, remember leaven is a picture of sin, so unleavened is a picture of sinlessness. The unleavened bread was baked with oil and frankincense, which is a priestly direction, and the oil, picture of the Spirit of God. It was baked, and then after it baked, it was slathered over the top, as with butter, it was slathered with even more oil. And then that oily, beautiful, salted piece of bread would then be broken and offered up on the altar. A picture of Jesus, who was at the same time sinless, who is our spirit-filled Savior, who, who had the Spirit come upon him at his baptism, so the Spirit within him baked in, and the Spirit upon him slathered across the top, and then broken as he was at the crucifixion. And the meal offering is a voluntary offering, It was a voluntary act of Jesus for our freedom, for our liberty in Christ, that we might be found acceptable before the Lord. The meal offering, the burnt offering. Choose them from among yourselves, the Lord says, a lamb uh, without defect. And that lamb then, that male lamb, would be offered up voluntarily on the altar before the Lord for atonement. And in this offering, every aspect of that lamb, it was completely engulfed, consumed in the fire, in the flames. Just as Jesus... The lamb without defect was engulfed by the fiery wrath of God completely. We saw this Wednesday night. Psalm 18 verse 7 gives us God's actions in the spirit realm at the time of the crucifixion. You know, what we read in other places in the Bible about the crucifixion, even prophetically we'll see in Psalm 22, what we read about the crucifixion is always from a physical earth standpoint. We see Jesus on the cross, lifted up, hands pierced, feet pierced, you know, crown of thorns. We see all this stuff from a physical perspective. You ever wonder what was going on spiritually? Listen to Psalm 18. I believe we have some insight. Then the earth shook and quaked, and the foundations of the mountains were trembling and were shaken. We know that happened at the crucifixion. Because he was angry. Smoke went up out of his nostrils, fire from his mouth devoured, coals were kindled by it. He bowed the heavens also and came down with thick darkness under his feet. This is the anger, the wrath of God happening at the time of the crucifixion. God was active. He wasn't just, you know, uh, rearranging the sock drawer in heaven. Off doing something else, just, you know, unconcerned. God was engaged and involved. And Psalm 18 tells us if we're to take this as actual fact, that when he bowed the heavens, he came down in thick darkness. And it was dark for three hours at the time of the crucifixion. What was going on spiritually? Earthquake? Darkness? God came down? What did God come down to do? A couple of things. To split the veil, for one, top to bottom. 
And also God came down to smite Jesus. To pour out His wrath on Christ Jesus, His only beloved Son. Because Jesus on the cross had to take the full weight of God's wrath. And God came down to do this. And so as the people cry, may He remember all your offerings, find your burnt offering acceptable. Oh God, we pray, remember Jesus. And may you find our offering acceptable. Remember His sacrifice and accept us, Lord, not because of our deeds, but because of His deeds. And remember that as you go into battle. The meal and burnt offerings were pre-war offerings. Eve before the war. In the same way, the crucifixion, if you look at it, was a pre-war offering. You see, the crucifixion doesn't guarantee we won't be persecuted. Did it with the first century church? Did it stave off the awful persecution that happened? Estimates in the first 60, well, so the first 200 years of the church, estimates between 7 and 10 million Christians were massacred because of their faith. The crucifixion was a pre-war offering. It was an offering up of Jesus before the battle. But, but, even though the martyrdoms happened and the deaths happened and, and the persecution goes on even to this day, the battle itself is secured. And you need to know and I need to recall that we are remembered before the Lord because of that offering of Jesus Christ. As long as we're here, we will still have to fight the good fight of faith. But we are remembered and the battle is secure. At that point, they say, Selah, pause to think about, to recognize all that has been prayed. And then they continue on in verse 4. May He grant you your heart's desire and fulfill all your counsel or purpose. And we will sing for joy over your victory. And in the name of our God, we will set up our banners. May the Lord fulfill all your petitions. Now, consider this. This psalm was written... In fact, we're told there at the beginning of it, it's for the choir director. The psalm was written for the choir director, therefore given to the Levitical priest, the, the worship team, there at the tabernacle in Jerusalem. Here, pass this out. Here's the sheet music. Sing the song. On the eve of battle. I want you to consider this picture. Imagine this. The people are there now. They're gathered in Jerusalem. The Ammonites are in full battle array at the gate. The Aramaeans are drawn up in the field and a total between the two, somewhere between 32,000 chariots, 40,000 foot soldiers, vast armies arrayed against Jerusalem and the people of Israel gather there by the tabernacle and the worship leaders begin the song of praise (laughs) before the battle. The worship goes up. I don't know what the Aramaeans were thinking, you know, what the Ammonites were thinking as they're hearing. Is that worship music? This guy, is that Chris Tomlin's new tune? What is going on with this? It's just bizarre. It reminds me of another incident, Paul and Silas. Remember they were thrown into prison in Acts chapter 16? And they're down there literally in the belly of the prison in the depth of it. Their feet are in the stocks. And we're told Acts 16.25, But about midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns of praise to God. I love Paul and Silas. We're in prison. Hallelujah. Singing songs. God is with us. Hey, got my feet in the stocks, feeling good. You know? It's just amazing faith. Joy and praise and worship of the Lord. And we're also told the prisoners were listening to them. Hey, listen. As you worship God through even the tough times of your life, the prisoners are listening. As you praise God, free in Christ, the prisoners are listening. And they're hearing the worship, and they're seeing the praise. You guys, you know, worship a little bit long there at the bridge on Sunday mornings. Yeah? Yeah? So that the prisoners might hear, as well as that we might lift up our hearts in praise to God. That's faith, my friends. Paul and Silas, the people of Israel, worshipful certainty that victory is secure. David wrote this, but the people might sing it to remind him and the warriors that, hey, we're with the Lord. And we're praying for you as you go out into battle before the battle is even waged. What do you think this song on the eve of war did for the heart of the king? You know, to hear the people singing like this, if you were David, if I was David, I'd be going, all right, okay, pump us up, let's go. 
We're ready to go to war. The Lord is with us. Number four in your notes, if you've been jotting these things down, it is a royal reassurance. Royal reassurance. A royal reassurance. We were praying beforehand in the worship team, and I, and I was praying, I don't know what's going on, and I've told you this before, I don't know what's happening in your life. I don't know what battles you might be facing. I don't know what your particular struggles are. I barely keep up with my own. But I can tell you with certainty this. The Lord is with you. The Lord is with you. And you might say, well, that's great for David. You know, 3,000 years ago to hear the people sing, knowing the Lord's with him. It's in another time and place. But Rick, this is a prayer for a king, and I'm no king. Really? You sure about that? I find myself wondering why this has come up three Sundays in a row. Perhaps you're the reason. Maybe I'm the reason. Three Sundays in a row, this whole focus of you and I being, as Psalm 8 declares, majestic ones. Psalm 16 declares, majestic ones. People of majesty. People lifted up. People exalted in the Lord, by the Lord, because of the Lord. And Peter wrote in 1 Peter 2.9, Hey, you're a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for God's own possession, so that you may proclaim the excellencies of Him who has called you out of darkness into His marvelous light. What kind of a priesthood are we? A royal priesthood. I, for whatever reason, the Lord is hammering this point home to the Bridge Fellowship. You are royalty. You are kings, small k, but you're kings. You are children of the great king, which means you are princes and princesses of God the Father. You are royalty in this world, and you have a royal calling. Keep your finger there and turn over to the book of Revelation, chapter 1. It's one of the easiest books in the Bible to find. Revelation chapter 1 and verse 6. Remember, we're talking about looking for, listening for royal reassurance as David was reassured. Going into battle. Revelation chapter 1 verse 6 tells us that he has made us to be a kingdom. Priests to his God and Father. To Him be the glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. And we need to understand something here. When you think of a kingdom, typically what you think of is the king and the castle on the hill, and then you think of the villages surrounding that and the peasants. And you might think, okay, well, we're the peasants of the kingdom. We're part of the kingdom. But, you know, we're just the lowly peasant. But the translation does not indicate that. In fact, if you read this in the King James, it tells us He has made us to be kings. Well, my NASB says kingdom, Rick. But the, NASB, the, the King James says kings. Well, someone's mistranslated. No, they're both translating correctly. But you need to understand that the word here in the Greek is basileia, where we get the word basilica. Basileia in the Greek speaks of, it literally is kingdom, but it speaks not of the territory of a kingdom, but the right to rule the kingdom. Now, when the Greeks used the word basileia, they referred to the ruling authority, to the kingdom power. And so when John writes that he has made us to be a kingdom, what he's saying is you have kingdom authority. You have a royal calling. You are a holy priesthood. You are kings. You are queens unto God the Father. It's absolutely stunning. The kingdom of God is more than territory on a map. It is authority in Christ Jesus. And that's great power. Let's skip on over to Revelation chapter 5. Verse 9. And I'll be honest with you. I told you last week I struggle with this kind of stuff because I tend to lean toward the humble approach that we're mealy-mouthed little Christians and we just kind of stay low and say, praise God, you know. But he is calling us out to be who we were called to be. Royalty because of and in Christ Jesus. Revelation chapter 5 verse 9 tells us they sang a new song. By the way, there's a song that only redeemed people can sing. Listen to it. Worthy are you to take the book and break its seals for you were slain. You you purchased for God with your blood 
from every tribe and tongue and people and nation. You made them, and the word them is the first person, personal pronoun. In other words, it is you made us to be a kingdom and priest to our God, and literally we will reign upon the earth. Now we're getting into something else. It's more than just called a kingdom. It's more than just a spiritualized concept of authority. You have a royal future, a future where you are called to rule and reign with Jesus in His coming kingdom. I'm just not sure if I can buy that. Turn to Revelation chapter 20. Of this verse. Revelation chapter 20, verse 6. Blessed and holy is the one who has a part in the first resurrection. Over these, the second death has no power. What's the second death? It's the death of the Spirit. It's the eternal death. It's damnation. The first death is just a physical death. No big deal. Walk through that door. The second death is the one you want to avoid. And so, blessed and holy is the one who has a part in the first resurrection. Over these, the second death has no power. But they will be priests of God and of Christ and will reign with Him for a thousand years. Isn't that allegorical? Well, six times in Revelation 20, the phrase a thousand years is used not as a metaphor. You have a ruling and a reigning that is promised, that is guaranteed, that is coming. And Hebrews chapter 12 verse 28 tells us we receive a kingdom that cannot be shaken. And the word receive, just to drive this home a little more, in the Greek the word receive is the present active participle. Get it? (laughs) No, neither did I. I had to look up. What does that mean? (laughs) It means we are receiving... We are in process right now of receiving a kingdom. We are receiving a kingdom. Our hearts being developed. Our minds grasping this concept of our royalty. I know you look in the mirror. I do too. I know we look around and go, royalty? Really? He's got rips in his jeans. Right on. Royal jeans. Her hair is unkempt. So what? Physical doesn't matter. We are royalty. We are receiving a kingdom. That is, we are being given the kingdom. And it's far more than residential territory. It is the right to rule. And we need to get that. We've got to understand this. Let me give you just one more amazing promise. Uh, Leave Revelation and go to the book of Isaiah. It's just two books past the Psalms. uh, Three books past it. There toward the middle. Isaiah chapter 41. One more passage. Isaiah 41. Do you feel yourself getting it all excited? Because I do. And this was the intent of Psalm 20, to to get the king excited in faith, in confidence, in trust on the eve of battle. Watch this, Isaiah 41, verse 10. Do not fear the Lord speaking through the prophet, for I am with you. Do not anxiously look about you, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. Surely I will help you. Surely I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. Behold, all those who are angered at you will be shamed and dishonored. And those who contend with you will be as nothing and will perish. You will seek those who quarrel with you, but you will not find them. Those who war with you will be as nothing and non-existent. For I am the Lord your God who upholds your right hand, who says to you, do not fear. I will help you. Do not fear, you worm, Jacob. (laughs) You men of Israel, I will help you, declares the Lord. And your Redeemer is the Holy One of Israel. Behold, I have made you a new, sharp, threshing sledge with double edges. And you will thresh the mountains and pulverize them. And will make the hills like chaff. You will winnow them, and the wind will carry them away, and the storm will scatter them. But you will rejoice in the Lord. You will glory in the Holy One of Israel. You worm, Jacob, he says. Which tells us exactly who Jacob was in and of himself. A worm. A conniver. A liar. But I am the God of Jacob who can take even that wormy little guy and make something of him. Something wonderful. Something 
absolutely stunning in the history of the world that I'm taking out of Jacob this little people that everybody is set against. And the day is coming, God says, when you're going to look for enemies, Israel, you're not going to find them. They will be non-existent. Why? Because of the worm Jacob and all his fighting ability? Because of the Lord, the Redeemer, who is the Holy One of Israel. Now, we read that, and you might say, well, isn't this for Israel? I am not into replacement theology, you know that. I do not believe that the church replaces Israel and steals all the promises. However, this is a promise for any and all who call upon the God of Jacob. We have been grafted in. So while we don't take the promises to ourselves away from Israel, we can, we are called to share the promises of Israel. As we stand with the people of God, as the people of God grafted in, this is a promise for all who call on the name of the God of Jacob, all God's royalty. And so when you feel like cowering, take courage. God says, because I'm with you, you will be unstoppable. Because I am with you. I don't know why you need to know this now. But I do know big things are coming in this world. Things for which we as children of God, royalty of the Lord, need to be prepared. Hearts confident, faith strong, Minds sharp and prepared, spirits ready. Big things are coming. As I mentioned before, the crescent moon is closed, indicating the desire for world conquest, at least from one people group. By the way, did you know what the number one name is in England today? Number one name this year in England, Muhammad. Well, why is that? Well, it indicates the population growth of Islam in England. Great Britain. There's a growing thought that perhaps we were wrong about the United Nations or the European Union being the roots of Antichrist world power. There's a growing curiosity, study, interest, some who are saying that perhaps that world power under the control of Antichrist will be Dar al Islam. Do you think so, Rick? I haven't studied it enough to know, to be honest. I'm looking at it. There's a book out, if you're interested in these things, called The Green Horse by Norma Archbold. And you might want to check that out, The Green Horse. Very interesting, very factual, the way she goes through and historically follows the growth of Islam. Could it be that this is the growing world power? It might be. But whether it's Dar al-Islam or vestiges of some revitalized Roman Empire or some other global system of dominance... Please apply these words. Romans 8, 37. In all these things we overwhelmingly conquer through Him who loved us. Well, Pastor, are you saying we're going to see the tribulation and we're going to see that dominant world power? No. I don't believe we'll see the tribulation. I think the Bible is pretty clear that we'll be caught up before that. However, we will see dark days leading up to it, I believe. I, I think we already are seeing dark days leading up to it. And it's entirely likely that these days will get far worse prior to our being called home. Hey, we were not destined for wrath, but for salvation through Jesus Christ. The Bible tells us, 1 Thessalonians 5, 9. But though we were not destined for God's wrath, that doesn't mean we're not going to face intense and incredible persecution. Look at the history of the church. We may be in for that. And I don't say that to rattle anybody, but to say, hey, on the eve of battle, O kings, O queens, be encouraged. Because the Lord your God is Lord and is God. Note this, the people have been singing this for the king. Now the king responds, verse 6. Now I know that the Lord saves his anointed, Mashiach. He will answer him from his holy heaven with the saving strength of his right hand. Some boast in chariots and some in horses, but we will boast in the name of the Lord our God. They have bowed down and fallen, but we have risen and stood upright. Save, O Lord, in the Hebrew, Hosanna. May the king answer us in the day we call. I love this. Now David, in answering the people, turns his focus off of himself as king, with a lowercase k, to the king of kings, capital K, to the Lord. But the point I'm getting at here as we study through this, 
And what I, I think the Lord wants us to recognize is that we are more like King David than we are like the people in this psalm. We are more like King David. What are you saying? We've already established our royal calling. Whether you accept it or not, that's what you've got to deal with today. You've got to struggle with and come to grips with the fact that you are called to royalty. I was watching Lord of the Rings last night again with my wife and going through the very first one. And the character of Aragorn, if you've ever seen the movie, it's a great movie. I just love it. I love the, the call to valor and to courage and, and, and uh, chivalry and all that is in the movie. But anyway, Aragorn, this character, is the king who will not be king. His whole character is he does not want it. He's afraid that if he goes down that road, he's going to do what his forefathers have done and mess things up. And so he's just, he's the reluctant king. And I'm watching him going, that is me. Maybe that's you. The reluctant king. The reluctant warriors. The reluctant royalty. Who are just saying, I just don't know. I don't know if I can buy this. It's just little me. Well, listen. There are people praying on your behalf. There are those who are praying On your behalf. Like the people. Praying for David. Lifting up prayers. Interceding for David. Calling out that encouragement for David. It's going on for you. It's going on for me. And I've been processing this. And I'm sure there's more to this. But Hebrews 12.1 tells us we are surrounded by a great cloud of witnesses. What are they doing? What are they doing? Are they cleaning their sock drawers? We're surrounded by a great cloud of witnesses. And the Hebrew writer says there's encouragement there. Are the cloud of witnesses praying for us even now? Possibly. I don't want to go too far out on a limb here, but possibly they're crying out from the heavens. They're saying, may the Lord answer you in the day of trouble. May the name of the God of Jacob set you securely on high. We know Jesus said there is joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. Luke 15.10 So are the angels watching? Are they cheering us on? Is it possible that the angels are saying, may He send you help from the sanctuary and support you from Zion? Hey, we know this. Jesus intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. Romans 8.27 Even Jesus Himself, might He be saying, may He remember all your meal offerings and find your burnt offering Myself. Acceptable. You better believe there's some great prayer going on for you right now. For whatever your battle is that you might face, for whatever is ahead of the church as a whole, for the royalty that are here living in faith and confidence and trust in the Lord, these prayers are ongoing. We will sing for joy over your victory. And in the name of our God, we will set up our banners. May the Lord fulfill all your petitions. Can you hear that prayer being prayed for you, calling you up, preparing you for battle, encouraging you? And can you answer as David did in verse 9, Save, O Lord, Hosanna. May the King answer us in the day we call. We are kings. We are kings. Called to royalty in Christ Jesus. Surrounded by a great cloud of witnesses, cheered on by the joy of the angels, encouraged by the intercession of Jesus himself. But, but don't forget this, like David, we are to never lose sight of the fact that Jesus Christ is the King of Kings. Let's pray. Fathers, we close our Bibles on this prayer for kings. Lord, I'm stunned at the thought that perhaps this prayer, though historically for David, is prophetically for us. A prayer of encouragement. A prayer that calls us to our rightful place as a people who are receiving a kingdom. And Lord, we bend the knee, we we bow the head to Jesus Christ as King of Kings. And we have no No thought, no heretical notion whatsoever that we might rise to that place. But we recognize because Jesus rose, we also will arise. That there is an exaltation going on here that is stunning to us. It is unmerited. We haven't earned it or deserved it. Oh, Father, we're like David on the hills of Bethlehem when Samuel came to anoint him. What's this all about? But I pray, Father, that this confidence will permeate us. 
And that we will believe that we are called in a royal calling. And in accepting that, we'll have boldness in this world. That we will move and walk like people who have the authority of Christ, not fearing. Not fearing, Lord, other religions. Not fearing those who would silence the gospel of Jesus. Not fearing the smaller circumstances of our lives. The little battles that are waged against us. Not fearing the enemy at all. Father, secure us in this royal place, we pray. In Jesus' name. Amen.